Hello, Charlie. Hello, Joanne. <laughs> How are you? I'm very, very well indeed. Are you excited for this podcast? Super, super excited. I'm so excited for people to hear your story and your accent. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Are You Ready with Joanne Molinaro. How many of you have watched the movie Jerry Maguire? If so, I'm sure you can remember that scene at the very end where Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character gets all choked up. I've always wondered whether those kinds of relationships with agents were real or simply the stuff of Hollywood fluff, but I never in a million years imagined that I'd one day get a chance to find out firsthand by working with my own Jerry Maguire. As I've stated in countless interviews, previous podcast episodes, and even on my own social media channels, Charlie is the Brit that made all my dreams come true. He not only agreed to represent me when I was a full-time lawyer with a very small food blog, he encouraged me to write what I wanted to write, whatever shape that took. He helped me put together a book proposal, which led him to negotiating a five-figure book deal that, at the time, had me picking my jaw off the ground. But that's not where this story ends, of course. A couple years ago, when I started getting bombarded with requests for speaking engagements, I turned to Charlie. He put me in touch with the head of an old-school speakers agency to help navigate a budding career as a keynote speaker, now a very significant part of my income. He also helped me find a team that would help me manage my social media accounts, all of which exploded, it seemed, overnight. But my representative of Quan moment? Well, it came in 2021. My first cookbook had just been published, and it did a lot better than anyone, myself included, imagined it would back when I was pitching an entire cookbook containing plant-based Korean food. I was also determined to leave behind a full-time career in law, and I knew that doing so rested heavily on whether I could negotiate a second book deal that would serve as the launch pad for my creative career. In other words, the number attached to that book deal had to make sense, a number that not only provided me with some measure of financial confidence, but that also reflected my value as an author. Charlie and I had multiple conversations, not really about a number, so to speak, but about the dream overall. I was basically tasking Charlie to go out there and make my dreams come true again. In late 2021, while I sat cross-legged on the bed in my hotel room in New York City and Charlie sat primly at his desk in London, both our eyes filled with tears as he broke the news. The offer from my publisher, the one that had faith in me when I was a virtual nobody, continued to have enough faith in me to put together a two-book deal that would secure me for years to come. So, without further ado... I'd like to introduce you to Charlie, my agent, my representative of Quan. So maybe just tell the Are You Ready community who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. I'm, um, I'm a literary agent um, from the UK. Uh, even better, I'm lucky enough to be your literary agent, Joanne. Um, so a literary agent is a sort of matchmaker between authors and publishers. So our job is to find you the best possible partner as an author um, uh, into, that, into that publishing community. And um, it takes you to a lot of great, interesting places with amazing people. So I feel very lucky to be doing it. Amazing places with interesting people. How did you decide to go into publishing and in particular to become a lit agent? It's a very good question. Um, I don't know when here you sort of start doing interning or sort of work experience, but in the UK, it's sort of, sort of 17, 16, 17, you start doing sort of a few different types of jobs with different professions. Um, I tried my hand out at law for about a week. Not sure, <laughs> not sure I was particularly... Survived one week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and was very impressed uh, and did some stints with sort of music industry stuff. And then I had this amazing sort of few weeks interning at a place which was uh, in Soho. And it was sort of the archetypal... Um, sort of 
the literary agents literary agency vibe that you would could have you would imagine um if you were sort of dreaming up the the, the sort of scenario so sort of creaking floorboards um you know uh back streets in a sort of historical area big sort of georgian townhouse and um the people who ran the agency were just really amazing with the with the young people coming in so the first day um i was taken off to the faber and Faber summer party, which was like one of the big sort of occasions of the year, but usually an intern wouldn't be taken there. And one of their clients at the agency, which was called Convol and Walsh, um, had just won the Booker Prize, someone wow. called D- <laughs> DBC Pierre. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know whether you remember the book, Vernon Godlittle, um, but his, uh, that DBC was short for dirty, but clean. Oh. Um, and he was like a sort of, pu- he was like a sort of punk new literary star. Um, he had sort of a, a crazy backstory and he just won the biggest prize and everyone was coming up to him saying, oh, we've, we've got to speak. His real name is Peter, so we've got to speak to you. And so you'd have Julian Barnes and Ishiguru sort of coming up and he just turned to me, the intern. He's like, I can't deal with this anymore. Let's just go, let's go around the back and have a drink. Really? And so I was like, is this what, is this what this <laughs> profession is like? I'd literally been like labeling records for the last like two weeks. And I was like, this this seems pretty this seems pretty interesting. I can I can deal with this. Did you like books? Loved books, yeah. So I did a I did an English lit degree. Um, you did you major in English I lit as well? Too. Yes. Yes. Um, so that was always I just sort of assumed that was the art form. That was always the highest art form for me. Um, so any sense of being able to get into it seemed like a you know potential joy. And, um, and I was just lucky enough to get that experience. And I don't think a lot of people know what literary agents particularly do. It's a, it's a fairly kind of unknown, unknown uh, profession. So um, learning that and then sort of unlearning, I guess, what you learn as, a, as an English grad was quite interesting. And then you're suddenly thrown into the world of commercial, commercial publishing, mm. which is quite different. So you interned when you were in high school or when you were at university? A uh, mix of both, actually. Yeah, so... Um, when I was at university, I used to come there and then do everything for them. So I'd even paint the office. Oh. I just wanted to, <laughs> I just wanted to get some money and survive <laughs> on the uh, on the periods where I was back. Um, but they were amazing with that. And uh, and then the moment that there was a kind of opportunity, they'd be they'd have their ear to the ground, probably because they wanted to get me out of the office, to be mm, honest. Mm. And um, and then that led led to a first job with a master's degree in East Asian studies in between. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah so that my, was a I random... had minor in East Asian studies in college. This is... This is getting a bit odd. No wonder we're <laughs> yeah, connected. So I wanted to actually go back to what you described as, you know, when you walked into the office, the creaking floorboards and sort of that Soho vibe, which is mm. very artistic vibe, and how you said a lot of people don't really know what lit agents do. I had no idea what lit agents do. It's pretty much informed completely by Bridget Jones <laughs> <laughs> and one random Korean drama that I watched, which were a bunch of lit agents. <laughs> Probably very different. Maybe if you could describe for us, like, what, what does a lit agent do in granularity? I mean, I know, like yeah. you said, it's about connecting authors to the right partner in publishing, but maybe on a day-to-day basis, mm. what does that look like? Yeah, it's a good question, actually, because... Each day is relatively unpredictable, but there are kind of, uh, there is the bread and butter of daily, daily sort of literary agent life. So you've got, you've got authors that are under contract that you've sold to a, sold to a publisher. Um, and you can either be negotiating that contract with another publisher, or you can be talking with the author about the cover design of a book, um, or you can be at the marketing and publicity campaign stage. So all books are in their different sort of life cycle. Um, if you happen to have sort of two hours clear in the morning, which actually never happens, you read. So you tend to sort of read outside of those hours. Um, So one of the great things is like working on a proposal to send to a publisher. And that's when an agent, I guess, can do a bit more of the sort of editorial side, which is kind of the more creative aspect of it. Um, So you could be doing all of those different things in a day, um, which is kind of what makes it kind of fun. Mm. Or there could be a huge argument going on between a publisher and an author and an agent and you're, you're, you know, you're solving a problem. Sort of acting as a mediator. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many questions that I have, but I wanted to go back to kind of you as a high school student going into college and it sounds like you were a pretty voracious reader. Would you say that's right? I loved reading. Yeah, that's, you know, the opportunity to do that around, I only had six hours taught at university. So you essentially just ended up 
doing as much reading around that as possible. It was, what kind of books did you enjoy? Like, what were your top five favorite books, if you can rattle them off before ooh. you became a lit agent? Oh, uh, before becoming a lit agent. Yeah. Um, uh, that, that's a really good question. Mm-hmm. Um, it's difficult, yeah, because it's I've, I've reread a lot of books that so they've sort of changed in my mind to me. But um, at the time, I think I was big into, I used to read quite a lot of Ballard, J.G. Ballard, um, partly, oddly, because he lived where my grandparents lived oh. in, in Shepparton. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also, he was quite influential on Martin Amis and Will Self, whose novels I went on to read. Um, but... Yeah, he, he wrote Empire of the Sun, which was made into oh, that big, wow. big movie. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of his kind of fiction was about um, sort of s- s- animalistic desires that come in um, as a result of uh, the, the, the sort of dislocation of war. Like Lord of the Flies. So, yeah, really, really, really fun, really fun <laughs> yeah, stuff. A little macabre. Um, a little yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> For a high school student. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you, you're sort of, you're trying to find almost a voice outside of the curriculum because you're, you're going to be studying Wuthering Heights. Mm. You're going to be studying. But then, you know, we were quite lucky once we got sort of 17, 18, you're studying like Michael and Darche and people like that, the English patient. Oh, um, so, you know, it was a good, it was good all round, quite mixed. So you could go down that sort of path and then read those authors. So it was a nice, um, nice mix. Well, I've always found that voracious readers make the best writers. Uh, mm. I think Minjin is a great example of that. She talks about that in the foreword of her book, Free Food for Millionaires, that she became a student of writing as soon as she started reading the great books. It wasn't when she, you know, went into her writer's workshop and studied the traditional curriculum. There was this extracurricular curriculum, if you will, of just authors yeah. that she'd read. Had you ever aspired to be a writer yourself, given how much you loved literature? Actually, funnily enough, no. I think I realized quite quickly that I could edit and edit quite well and that that was such a distinct skill. It, all it made me do, actually, was respect people who could write more and more. But, but that is interesting about um, Min Jin because authors that read voraciously definitely turn out to be the Some best, of the best writers. writers, yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's absolutely true. Um, but another, actually another example of a historical novelist that kind of did that, um, read absolutely everything, including historical documents. Um, so again, kind of historical fiction overlap was Hilary Mantel. Um, and then she recreated the life of Thomas Cromwell in her mm. fiction to the point where historians would quote parts oh, no. of those novels thinking that they were the like real citable documents. Citable documents. <laughs> Um, that definitely happened with the place of greater safety, which is the French revolution one. Um, but, uh, she would also then leave it for six months and then say, I need my imagination to take this over. Um, so, no, and, 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 you know, examples like that just make you more respectful of just the whole enterprise. The craftsmanship. When did you realize that you were such a skilled editor? I mean, it's one of those things where I certainly didn't, have a lot of opportunities to edit, uh, you know, growing up. It wasn't probably until I started writing creatively that editing mm. became a big thing. Funnily enough, I think it was because I, I wanted a quick way through. I remember, I remember working in pairs at school and someone would actually figure out the science problem or the maths problem, but I would write it up in flowery language. Oh. Um, so I would just sort of spruce it up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and oddly, that's sort of become a bit of a genesis story for then just enjoying that aspect of it. Mm. Um, it's the joy of language, I think, um, but the actual creative, the, the original creation part, um, you're only ever, you, you, you want to be a vehicle for that. You want to help people to find it. Mm. Did you ever think of veering away from the sort of, you know, directly commercial aspect of publishing, which I do view lit agents <clears throat> to be sort of more embroiled in that than say being an editor at a publishing house or even just being a freelance editor, if you enjoyed that aspect of it so much? That's a good question. I, I kind of, I love the breadth of what you do as an agent. Um, so you're sort of, you're kind of out there a bit, a bit more, you get that freedom of working on all different aspects. Um, so you miss out on the that edit that sort of really forensic editorial, um, but I, I've, I've you know I haven't done that to that to that extent um, where you know you're really taking over something and you've got a slightly different relationship with the author. But a lot of people do do it. I've just um, I think I just enjoyed agenting and never mm. never went over. 
that's an interesting thing that you said about editing because I feel many authors have, like you said, very different types of relationships. I've talked to fellow authors whose agents played a very substantial role in producing the proposal or mm. even the book um, from an editing perspective, whereas I felt our relationship was very hands-off. <laughs> right. Charlie, did you read it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just because you were so good. Oh, it's fine. Okay. A plus. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think um, if, you take to, if you take to the task quite quickly and you get uh, the way that you shape your proposal sort of made, it made immediate sense. And it was such a good extension of what you were, of what you were doing. Um, you know, and I think that it, it, once you've got the structure of that book, the actual, the actual writing out of it is not as tech, you know, it's not as text based. Um, and I don't think I could criticize your photography. <laughs> so uh, you'd have been, you'd have been very annoyed. I, I do remember the first novelist I ever represented um, we did a we did we did a sort of creative writing talk together at his university, and uh, he reminded me that before I offered him representation, I'd already killed off two of the characters in the in the book. That's a pretty big deal. Um, so that's a pretty big editorial hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it does. It sort of depends. I mean, if fiction's probably something where you know your commercial eye on it might really change, might really change something. Um, whereas, whereas cookery i think there are certain sections within a proposal where having that sort of objective eye is 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 useful because you're playing up you know the kind of pitch elevator pitch aspect well i wanted to kind of go from where we left off of your career arc you interned at this lit agent is that where you ultimately became full-time employee after graduating um no so luckily they they found me a job um so i worked at one of the oldest uh, literary agencies um, in London called AM Heath. Um, and then I just really benefited. I had a couple of amazing mentors. That agency was so well established that it had authors from the 30s. So it represented the George, George Orwell estate. Are you um, serious? Yeah. So oh, That must so, have been like a dream come true to work somewhere like that. It had, it had an extraordinary history. Um, and um, Bill Hamilton uh, ran it and he, he, he uh, was, was responsible for the oil estate. And even within that, just the, just the amount of things that came, came from it. So, you know, you'd have play adaptations of 1984 going on in sort of Czechoslovakia um, and all sorts of different, you saw this sort of the, the influence of a particular author. Um, but because, because they had so many legacy authors, I got, became obsessed with 1930s novelists um, and would read sort of Patrick Hamilton on my time off. So that in a way, like satisfied that kind of desire to, to read. And it was a great place to, to be able to do that and build up a bit of a, bit of a knowledge of everything that, well, I say everything. Um, you, you tend to read the authors that the, the agencies represented and yeah, you get your kind of nourishment that way. Did you stay at that lit agency at Heath, is it called? Yeah, I, st yeah, I stayed there for about five years. Um, and then I worked with Ed Victor, um, who was, he sort of sort of single-handedly changed like literary agenting. So um, it used to be called Seedy and Tweedy um, because it was just it was a bit it was a bit scruffy, a bit sort of shabby shabby chic kind of thing. Wait, so Seedy and Tweedy like literally as in it's Seedy and it's a little bit Tweedy. It was just it was just like you know the Tweedy. I thought that was the name of a firm. So. Oh right, sorry. Yeah, no, it just it, 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 for some reason it had that it had that uh, phrase sort of. Uh, associated with it and then he he kind of he became the sort of literary agent to the stars um so i think in tatler one year he was um the second most invited person to a party to parties after elton john um and he sort of repped uh keith richards but also repped rs murdoch and douglas adams you're a douglas adams fan hitchhiker's mm. guide to the galaxy i did read that book you're pretty well versed in your kind of sci-fi sci right? <laughs> yes i did read that book maybe in high school a right. long time ago yeah, <laughs> yeah. um but yeah it's just, just equally equally happy in any environment absolutely loved loved the job um and was kind of anglo anglo-american so um he came over in the 70s um and he just made from it america from america yeah. started a literary agency um and just made it fun every day and absolutely loved it and so he we worked really closely together and that's partly why 
I've always worked in America um, because he was just absolutely brilliant at the kind of opening doors there. And um, it's been so much fun to be able to, to do that. And uh, you no longer work at his firm, correct? Yes. Yeah. So I started um, BCM, my agency, uh, almost five years ago. No, five and a half years ago now, which is crazy. But I suppose um, I suppose there were a couple of strange years in the middle of that, mm-hmm. weren't there? Mm-hmm. Um, what was that like? Well, it was odd for everyone, wasn't it? But pu- <laughs> publishing actually had two kind of record-breaking years. So people, we had a captive audience, didn't we? Um, we did. So, you know, people actually, in, in terms of live arts, people couldn't go out to theatre, um, weren't going out to cinema. And now people's habits have, have changed. But luckily, people seem to pick up the habit of reading. Um, during the pandemic. During the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And it's a question of whether, it's a question of how long that can... Um, tale yeah exactly mm-hmm. yeah. um so it's an interesting it's an interesting time because you know we're now we're now in a slightly different economic uh, situation yeah. um, don't we- worry we won't go on to um <laughs> <laughs> as 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 our emails often seem to be yeah, sort of gonna... sort of mutual commiseration <laughs> <off into it. laughs> um, but i guess i was more asking in terms of you've been working at at a firm or working with pretty established agents who it it sounds like either provided mentorship or leadership or certainly some guidance as you were kind of navigating your career earlier on. Was there any sort of trepidation involved with deciding I'm going to step out on my own and create my own agency? I did feel very confident about the fact that it was the right thing to do. Um, And that was partly because the way the way Ed worked was to sort of partner people up with lots of lots of different um, people across different media or, or specialists in different areas. So the difference for me was that that was a real the joy of networking and you know meeting people that were say producers or were talent agents or managers or you know it, it was just a different way of 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 of, of doing the job which um, which brought you into contact with loads of different people. Um, and being able to offer that kind of bespoke way of doing it appealed to me. And I ran the um, the film and TV uh, and speakers bureau at the at the company. So we in addition would, to being a lit agent, yeah, yeah, which was just a great kind of. I mean, it probably packed quite a few years into into a small space, but I was just loving every minute. I guess one of the other things that I wanted to talk about when you were describing sort of your day to day tasks, or even just rattling off here the things that lit agents generally do. One of the things that I didn't hear you mention was identifying talent. Mm. How do you determine who you ultimately want to work with? Yeah, it depends. If it's um, so, sometimes people will be submitting cover letters and making making an approach to agents. Um, so that happens more with uh, that always that tends to always happen with fiction, um, whereas nonfiction, um, which is probably the majority of um, the authors that I work with are in that in that area although it's a big you know it's quite a broad broad church um that will often be me sort of seeing something that that really interests me like someone's doing a series of lectures say on a particular subject and you think wow that's that's kind of a different way of 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 looking at you know and, and I think at the moment of looking at a particular subject and I think there's a real appetite for sort of revisionist history and looking at our past in a different way so serious nonfiction that's um that's tackling some of the some of the issues i guess that we're facing across the board i think people are really engaging with that um so there'll be people that i think have a real voice and then you then you approach them and then it's a case of you know whether they're intrigued about writing a book um how much space they have to do that if they're an academic um so it it really depends do you have to be a good writer i think you ha- yeah you have to be able to I, th- I think if if you're an academic you have to be able to convert that into into something which you know the the layman can pick up and and yeah make it and have an and have a narrative um the better the writer obviously the better the book um, but some books could be more more technical than others, um, so it sort of depends. Do you feel like the authors need to have some sort of um, charisma or even a celebrity status? Are these things that you know, for some of the people who are listening, they might be interested in writing a book or working with a lit agent. Mm. I mean, are there things that they need to worry about in addition to saying, "Well, I think I have a good written work product." 
Yeah, it's a good point. I think publishers are more more and more interested in somebody who already has some kind of existing platform um, or they have such an extraordinary story that you can't imagine anyone else writing writing something remotely similar, um, in which case they don't need to have a sort of pre-existing um, following. If you're, if you're in the, say, on the sort of cookery side, um, I think more and more they, you almost have to have built a certain... Um, platform before approaching pr approaching an agent or a publisher um, so that can happen at quite an early point if you've got a really singular focus uh, but you probably need to have built up something in order to get the most out of it to be honest um, as you know it's a pretty intense experience I mean have you seen it change though over the years I mean you've been in this game now for decades there was no Facebook yeah. <laughs> 20 years ago. So, I mean, was, presumably there was no requirement to have a social media presence back then. Absolutely, yeah. So in terms of cookery, the context was it would either be celebrity cookery that was sort of, um, you know, from, from television, um, or it would be chefs that had become the, the, the kind of most well-known um, and most respected, um, running the most respected restaurants. And there was an era where there were very high-end restaurant cookery books, and that really has declined. You know, that's, that's very rare for that to happen now. Um, so it's more about the personality of the chef, um, if, if, if it's chef-led, and what they're doing in the restaurant, and whether it's following a particular um, style of cooking or cuisine. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, as you say, social media's like become I'd say almost the majority of cookery that's coming through is coming from people who have, you know, successful accounts. Wow. I did not know that. I remember when, um, I remember like after we had started the pitch process and I think we had already signed the book deal at, at a certain point, you said something to me, you said, well, what is your social media plan? <laughs> and I remember feeling extremely anxious about that because I was like, what do you mean? What's my social media plan? <laughs> like, it is what it is. I don't need any more pressure. But that is one of the things that stuck inside of my brain during one of our conversations. And it ultimately said, you know, led me to think about doing a TikTok account, which of course radically changed the trajectory of not just the book, but of my career, right? Yeah. Um, but kind of going back to what you were talking about, just putting to one side the cookery, which I feel like is a, a sort of a, not a niche, because it is a huge niche, right? But it has its own path, I guess, mm -hmm. through social media. But some of the other um, types of books, I, I know you mentioned you don't do a lot of fiction, but to the extent that there are people who are, you know, believe in their hearts that they are able or have the next great American novel stuck mm. inside their bodies. <laughs> How do they get the attention of a literary agent? I mean, is it literally like, here's my manuscript, read it, please? Yeah, so it's really, you know, it's quite a daunting process, but you, you start off by writing a cover letter to, to an agent. Um, and probably the best thing to do is try and research who the agent that you're targeting represents or, or your favorite novels or, or if, if, if you have a pitch for the book then the, the novelist that you're mentioning you know you, you probably want to find out um, who represents them or which agency um, and then that process is is almost taking a taking a step back and looking at your work you know from an objective market perspective um, and one thing that is genuinely useful is for authors to look at cover copy um, that publishers put together on the back of their books to see how they sell it. Um, so depending on the type of book, if it's a psychological suspense, you, you want to be pitching comparable books that have done very well in the market um, and where, where your book both fits in and kind of sets itself apart. Uh, but it's a difficult thing to do because you've just spent so much time, you know, honing this thing that's been, you know, a huge part of your life for, often years and then you're having to reduce that down i think people rightly find that really difficult um but in terms of a standout cover letter that's going to make an agent kind of want to read on um and and often that's the basis for how they're thinking about pitching it themselves and then that becomes like a chain of of pitching you know from the agent if they, if they take on the author then they're pitching to the editor, the editor's pitching to their in-house teams, and it just goes on to the, to, to the booksellers. Um, so that aspect of it um, is probably quite surprising. 
you know, you're suddenly having to do a bit more. I didn't know that people actually even read cover letters. So you're saying that the cover letter can make a big difference. <laughs> I think cover letters is absolutely key. I mean, it, it shows how the author's thinking about what they're doing. Um, and that in itself sort of speaks volumes because they're then going to move on to the next part of the process. And, you know, they're going to they're, they're going to want to make the most out of their out of the campaign. Um, and it's a difficult thing to ask someone to, to want to do all of those things at once. But I think, I think that's probably been an area of publishing that's changed. I mean, I know there are, there are older authors that find it surprising they have to promote their books now, yeah. um, but they kind of <laughs> have to do it. Yeah. Uh-huh. We'll talk about that because I definitely want to get into it. If you know, or if you can share on average, how often do you get cold cover letters from people that you've never heard of, don't even know, saying, hi, I'd, I'd love for you to consider working with me? I think I get about four to six submissions a day. A day? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it very, there, are, there are times of the year where there are, I'd say four to six is probably on the higher side. Um, and then, you know, there are particular seasons where it's quieter. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people do write in. A lot of people wrote, right over lockdown, um, which was a good opportunity for them to get an idea which probably had been sort of uh, gestating for a long time. Right. Yeah. I mean, so you're literally at least receiving over a thousand of these, you know, cover letters uh, per year. Do you, do you literally read through all of them or uh, do you get through to the manuscript in most cases? Uh, it does depend on the cover letter. Sometimes, wow, I mean, so that's uh, a huge gatekeeper. I didn't realize that. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting one. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, they are describing the book that you're about to you're about to read. Maybe read, and it may and it may yeah. be like th- there may be areas which you don't particularly cover, um, so you're not you're probably unlikely to to read that much of that manuscript. But um, for the most part, um, you it, it's just a great indicator of. And it, it should entice you to, to want to read on. want to turn that page just yeah, like exactly. a book. Yeah. Um, I guess the other question that I would have then is, what are some of the mistakes uh, that authors should avoid mm. when they are trying to present themselves to a literary agent? I think being relative, trying to be, trying to be quite humble, I guess, about what, it, you know, I, I think being ov- overtly impressed with what you've done possibly... <laughs> Isn't and that you know at that, least with Charlie Brothers. So no, well, no, so, 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 no. Sometimes, sometimes people go, "I don't really need, I don't really need an agent." But you know, so that's whatever, just, that's whatever just you, insulting. whatever you, whatever you say doesn't mean anything to me. But you know, I'm going to take your time anyway. And so you're like, I'm not. I wonder what you know. You, you're, you're thinking about the, the sort of personality, I guess, and 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 also you're sort of thinking ahead, like you know, you want to be able to get on, you want to be able to gel with 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 someone. Um, but yeah, there are. I mean. I think probably spelling and grammar mistakes get slightly exaggerated because you're a pro- you're quite querying a literary agent and you kind of want those things to be quite tight. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think being pithy, being able to condense quite a lot into a short space is is probably quite crucial. Um, so yeah, you don't want to you don't want to sort of pages long and you don't want intimate details about you know that that person's life particularly if it's not germane to the to the, the book, book right um and when they were physical submissions people used to send odd stuff they used to send like cigarette butts um if it was like a murder mystery and you'd just be like <laughs> or or it would be like the sort of lipstick on a page you just sort of yeah oh my god luckily luckily all all submissions are are, are emailed are digital now, now. yeah, <laughs> Bye, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so funny um I, I guess, you know, one of my favorite stories of, I hesitate to call it one of my favorite books, but it, it, it was a book that had an enormous impact on me. And, and for those of you who've been listening to the podcast for a while, you probably can guess what that book is. And it's called Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm always a little bit embarrassed uh, by how much impact that book had on my life, but it's undeniable. But one of the reasons I think it was so memorable to me was, of course, the incredible story of that author, mm. where she claims to have dreamt the story, uh, like Stephen King or something, and then wrote out this, you know, massive manuscript after having never written anything in her life before, had no idea how to submit it, get it published, and literally Googled, 
you know, lit agents mm. and got a list of them, you know, 10 of them, I think, and then just sent her book out to all 10. Right. And now look at her, uh, look at her book. She's created, you know, an empire. How likely is that scenario today? I didn't actually know that she, so, so there was, it was just, it was just the manuscript. She's like, there, is that a manuscript? I mean, maybe she put together a cover letter. I don't know, but I got the sense from her blog that she had no idea what she was doing. Mm. She just had this story. She had never written anything before. She wrote it down on paper, had a manuscript and she just sent it around. She hadn't, she didn't do any of the requisite research that you recommended. Yeah. She probably didn't look at the covers and the jackets of the books that, you know, she was uh, reading at the time. She just picked the 10 biggest lit agents and just sent them out kind of like your total cold call type of situation and I think when I heard that story I remember feeling so inspired I was yeah. like okay like if this woman could do this then maybe one day I could write a novel and I would just like literally send it out to 10 random people and, and then have a movie deal <laughs> yeah exactly no, I, mean, I, think, I think if you've got the you know if you've really got the goods then you know that kind of that kind of situation can happen and it probably still it probably still would happen um, because if it's a if it's a surefire hit you you'd, you'd want to think that agents would would still realise that um, you know there are, there are other stories where the famous sort of turn down stories mm. of J K Rowling sort of got rejected sort of dozens of times before before breaking through Lord of the Flies actually same same thing really I didn't yeah. know that about Lord of the Flies it was completely different the um, the plot line was completely different. Like it started off with them uh, sort of before before the crash. Ah. Oh. Um, but anyway, they, they they sort of edited quite a lot out. Um, but no, I think I think that's I think the Twilight story could still happen um, for sure. Is it more likely to happen though? Have the barriers to entry been lowered since she wrote that book? I mean, that was over twenty years ago. I think. Mm. I think there's a lot more creative writing schools. So I think there's a lot more that's coming through that's sort of being being vetted. Um, and and that can be a good that can be a really good idea for an author an aspiring author to just go through that process of sharing their work with a group talking about and getting used to talking about their work sort of almost you know almost with that requisite distance from it um and 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 so there's a lot more access to that now mm -hmm. which is a good thing um but because they've proliferated so much you know, you've got to you've got to really pick the one that's gonna the one that's gonna help you. Mm -hmm. I think what I think what's difficult is debut novelists have to be so it has to be so polished sort of when it goes out that actually it used to be that a publisher would see something really impressive about someone's debut and then they go, Oh right, well I'm gonna nurture I'm gonna nurture this author. Um but now it's much more sort of debut oriented. Um so they sort of expect to have the you know, the, the, fi the finished article. Mm -hmm. And so there's more resources for an aspiring author, author to, to go to, but the, the, yeah, the, the, the barrier. The creative to entry barrier is probably, higher. is probably higher. That's so interesting. I never thought of it that way. Um, I remember when I wanted to become a poet, I had all these aspirations of becoming a serious poet at some point, I think probably a decade ago. And I submitted a lot of my poetry to a number of different journals, got rejected at almost all of them. But I remember one editor took the time to send me an email, a very long one. And he said, you, you know, we're rejecting your submission. It's not going to make it into the journal. But I wanted you to know that your poetry is beautiful. Mm. It's very, very moving. And if you don't mind, here are my edits. And he went through and he annotated my poem. And it was a long one. And I, I have to tell you, I, I never appreciated anything so much in my entire life. I mean, it was one of the most like beautiful and generous things that I'd ever experienced a, as a writer. And I was wondering how often, if ever, do you take the time to really go through in detail mm. your work is good, but here's why I don't think we can work together. If you see talent, then you, you you want to you want to give you want to give something back um so i think i think the problem is just justifying the time to do it yeah um which is why i found that yeah. gesture so generous it's uh, but i think it i think it probably reflected the the fact that actually there was genuine there was a 
there was a genuine sort of sense that what you what you'd submitted showed real promise and talent um and that's that's when i'll want to sort of give give some feedback give some advice and so and i'll always say in that scenario if you decide if you decide to rewrite this or if you decide you're moving on to another idea i'd love to i'd love to stay in touch um so yeah i mean the the, the difference is you'll be sending a much more tailored individual reply, even if you're not actually offering representation. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time people do, people do then come back, back from that. Um, and, you know, they, that, that can be almost more satisfying because you've gone through that process. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So let's move on to the next stage of literary agent slash uh, or literary agent partnership with author. You've identified the talent You've decided we gelled together. Let's work on something together. Do you always know exactly what that person intends to work on at the time you decide to represent them? No, definitely not. I mean, especially if, if someone is, say, pr producing particular content and then they, they, they're trying to find a way of converting that, that can often that can often take several iterations sort of going back and forth. And you just sort of have several breakthrough moments. Um, and that's great because you sort of see someone finding their voice, um, and, and then suddenly you're, suddenly you've got that momentum. Um, suddenly you've got that thing that makes that you've got that reason for something to convert from something which is more small form to this, to this much bigger kind of volume based approach. So I have so many questions about that. And I just want to clarify when you say content, we're, I think a lot of the people who listen to, to my you know, content, my content thinks of content <laughs> mm. as, you know, social media, videos, yeah. YouTube, TikTok, uh, Instagram. That's what, that's why they call us content creators. But I'm assuming you're talking about not just that, you're talking about television content, radio content. You could be talking about a series of lectures, as you alluded to, a yeah. podcast. I mean, any kind of content trying to distill sort of the assets in that and put it in a different form. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It could be... You know, you could be trying to find, so you could have an expert who's, who sort of has some TV, who does some TV work, um, say, say a, a doctor um, who, do, who, does a, who does a deep dive into, say, I was, I was working, work with an author who did a deep dive into sort of clean eating and, and sort of unpacking the sort of myths from the truth. Um, and it, it got a lot of traction. And then we were thinking, well, what, how do we, what do we extrapolate from this and make into a much bigger, much bigger idea? Um, so we had the sort of basis of something, but the, the, the overall book was, was a much wider, it was a much wider study. Mm. Um, but it gave you, it gave you that sort of initial idea that actually, you know, that's something which people are interested in. How can we, how can we give, give them more and give them more detail and do what a book is essentially there, there to do is, is, is to kind of give, someone's expertise and really be able to answer, you know, several questions. So when you're approaching these potential authors who have caught your attention because of the content that they're creating or because they've submitted a stellar cover letter and or manuscript, how do you convince them that they should write a book? Mm. And I and I ask this because I, you know, friends with a lot of content creators who many of them in the cooking space. And to me, I'm always like, well, it's obvious you should do a cookbook. But a lot of them aren't convinced that that's actually a beneficial thing for their career arc or for any reason. Uh, you know, putting to one side the financial aspects of it, which I can sort of understand, but it's always baffled me that people are completely uninterested <laughs> yeah. in writing a book. And maybe that's because I, like you, love literature. I've always loved books. I've loved reading. And it's such a huge part of my life and, and what I love to do. Um, but maybe if you could just talk about how do you convince people that they should write a book when they're on the shelf about it? Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. So I, I think it is case by case. Um, so someone, someone who's less sort of coveting of the of the sort of physical object, and they just haven't had that kind. Of, they're not sort of steeped in that sort of personal tradition. Um, you know, then you're making a slightly different case. You're making a you're you're saying that this could help in in several different ways. Like a book can 
really help with your general kind of gravitas gravitas and credibility if you if you if you're working with a major publisher um you know it 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 can just give more range and breadth to the kind of opportunities that you might that you might have um so so it sort of has a it has a hidden value on top of whatever whatever deal you end up striking with the publisher um and then with someone who you're interested in what they might write you know they may have put out something that was like an idea on 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 twitter and you go you know do you think that could actually work over over book length and it might not be that original idea that then is the thing that becomes the book but you start a conversation um and you get to know what is important to that person and sometimes that can be a real slow burner it can take it can actually take years um sometimes back to the the, the series of lectures was interesting because um uh the author um whose whose who's book i um, was just showing you um had uh just hosted a series of lectures on shakespeare and race at the globe theater um and actually had been thinking of expanding that idea into a book and had been working with with academic publishing in academic publishing for years um so we literally had the same idea at the same time um so it was just literary it, it was, kismet exi- exactly beautifully <laughs> beautifully worded um so so it just depends but you you, you want to give the impression that a, you want to say, look, these are the publishers that I think would be best suited to this type of book, and this is what you'd hope to hope to be aiming for. These are these are the kinds of books that are doing really well at the moment. Um, you know, have they have you engaged with them? What sort of book do you want to write? Um, and then you can sort of slowly it sort of seeps in that that might that might work. You know, it's funny what you said about that example you used, or somebody post something on Twitter and you kind of pull that thread, if you will, to determine whether or not that has the ability to sustain a book length and mm. can continue capturing people's attention. This is the second time I've actually heard of that. And and the reason is because I literally spoke with someone a couple weeks ago who signed a book deal based upon a viral tweet. They literally tweeted something. That's and even, even better than Twilight. <laughs> yes, I know. That's very, very economical. You know, so do you literally like mine people's tweets to be like, is there an author in here that I can pluck out of Twitter land? <laughs> um, I, I can't claim to have ever, ever done that. Um, <laughs> but you, you, sometimes you can have someone who works in, I, I don't know, someone, someone who's working in government um, and they're passing something quite specific and it's, it's an issue that you think, wow, that they're, they're obviously in a position where they're expert on this and they've just posited a question which actually deserves, you know, a real inquiry. It's, it's probably quite rare. Mm, mm. Well, I thought her story was amazing when she explained it to me. And I was like, well, can I see your writing? I want to read. And she's like, I don't have any. I oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was just a tweet that went wow. viral. And, and, and she signed a two-book deal. And I think that's pretty remarkable. So, and it was based on the tweet. So, it was, it was nonfiction. Uh, yeah, it's a nonfiction based upon this tweet. It was a tweet about how you know the situation with overregulating, to put it nicely, uh, the books that we find in our libraries was hurtful to her because she grew up inside libraries and how the library was this very safe space mm. for her, and now she feels like it's under attack. And uh, it was you know retweeted by many, many libraries and librarians who understandably are feeling a lot of heat these Mm. days. And so, yeah, and now she has this book deal. And I just think that's such a remarkable story. And it speaks to this idea that I love. You know, Simu Liu, he talks about in his memoir as well that one of the reasons he believes that he was able to land his sort of you know, star making role in Shang-Chi was because he tweeted about it. Mm. He put it out there. He said, hey, I think it would be really cool to have an Asian American Marvel comic hero movie, right? I'm not good with the lingo on that, but that's generally what he tweeted. And a year later, that's exactly what he's doing. And he talks about how sometimes it's important to not hold your dreams so closely Mm. to yourself that you don't share them. If you don't share them in a broad way, then you are missing out on this opportunity to work with people who might help you Mm. if they knew of your dream, you know? They can't help you if they don't know that that's what your dream is, right? And so I just think it's 
you know, Twitter is such a fun example or threads, whatever you want to use right now, is such a fun example because it's, it's literally a way to broadcast your dream in some cases to the widest available audience. And you never know, there might be yeah. somebody out there who's saying, you know what, I think you're onto something and I want to help you achieve that. Um, I did want to ask, have you ever severely regretted rejecting <laughs> somebody <laughs> that wanted to work with you? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, or or there have been instances where, for whatever reason, you you haven't quite hit on the right... It hasn't quite worked um, in terms of where a particular manuscript's been at. And then, you know, someone's gone back to the drawing board and you know they've either got they've either used some of the kind of i guess the kind of creative back and forth and worked on something totally new and you know with every reason gone on to to kind of query um again um because you sort of you sort of reach the end of your kind of creative you know and then you you, you want to start on something really confidently um and that that is that has because you're creatively involved um, it means more mm. and um and then part of you is is really delighted for the individual uh, because b b because you've got on um uh, but then there's obviously part of you that would like to have been involved in seeing the seeing the thing come to fruition mm. um but yeah. is it anybody we know <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. No. Well, then it can't uh, be that big of a regret. <laughs> no, exactly. It's not like J.K. Rowling okay. or something. Oh, right. Yeah, nice. No, 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 I mean, yeah. And they're likely to be debuts that haven't come out yet. Yeah, um, oh, that's true. So, yeah, no. I mean, I'm hoping... I'm hoping Stephanie for Stephanie Meyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping for success within reason, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've identified the person you want to work with and you have ironed out sort of a framework for what that project that is going to be that you're ultimately going to work on, then take us through how do we create a proposal or a pitch? So, so then you're, I, th I think you've got the, you've, you've got the genesis for, for what the book is. Um, and then if it's, if it's nonfiction, you, you come up with a proposal and the proposal will include a kind of overview of the idea. That's the enticing kind of one to two pager. It's often quite a difficult thing to put together. So some, some people do that last, some people, you know, lead with that and that helps them to, to come through right, with the rest. With um, but on top of that, you need a clear chapter structure. You often need a sample chapter or two, um, depending on, depending on the project. Um, and then you need a kind of a really interesting about the author and about the market section and about the market section is that thing, I guess we were talking about earlier. It's like, what are the other books that are comparable in the market? Um, and obviously an agent's like, you know, going to be more involved on, 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 those aspects because they should know what is appealing to, to publishers and getting getting to sit up and take notice um, because they they want to emulate the success of other of other titles. Um, so it's a bit so it's a bit of a mix. You're giving a, you're giving a sense of the voice of the writer um, in that sample material. Um, the the overview can also sort of be it's it's a way to make sure you're answering all the questions that a publisher can have about what the market potential is of the book. Um, so the more you work on a proposal, usually, you know, the better the result is going to be. And also then an author then has more kind of creative control over what that book is when it's, when it's actually, when you've, you, when you're commissioned by a publisher, because you've got something to, you've got something very tangible to sort of fall back on. That's such an important point. And I think that oftentimes, especially newbie authors or debut authors, they don't think about that. They're so focused on simply getting a deal mm. that that's, you know, sort of all that matters. And especially if they have a robust social media following or other type of content that they can fall back on and say, well, you know, this publisher is going to want to sign me because I have 10 million followers on YouTube. I don't really need a very ironclad proposal if you don't pay attention to it on the front end, it's very possible that somewhere along the process, your original vision gets diluted mm. to such an unrecognizable degree. And at that point, like you said, you don't have a paper trail to say, yeah. no, hey, we were on the same page. This is how we all started together. I think that's such an important key point. How important is that proposal, though? I've often been told, particularly if you're a debut author, this is your first time project, you know, I've been told with regard to television, and maybe you can speak to this given your experience, 
your first pitch for a TV show, it's very important mm. that it's good. Like it's really good because this is your first impression to the world of producers and networks. And once they pass, they will likely pass for good. Yeah. Is it like that with your first proposal? I mean, does it need to be pretty much like 100% this is the best proposal ever <laughs> that I can produce at this time? Uh, I, th I think you want to be you want to be feeling confident about it. You know, you want to have had several iterations. It, it, often, if there's a bit of if there's been some difficulty, it's often worth the, the payoff um, to to really get it all singing together. Um, so it, again, it's like it's thinking: is this is this strong enough that it can it can answer the question from not just the editor but the marketeer for the book and the and the and the sales reps that are you know um is so the proposal it, often shared beyond the editor so yeah so um the the editor has to share it amongst everyone wow. um so again i mean i used to i mean uh, there is sort of publishing folklore where people used to do deals off the back of a, a napkin yes. at, at long <laughs> at long lunches um <laughs> i don't i sort of missed out when i when i when i started there was just a, there was a recession going on and <laughs> Everyone thought that ebooks were going to take over, um, you know. Oh, wow. So there were just harbingers of doom on all on all sides. So I, you know, my sights were set quite low. Like, <laughs> well, everything's a bonus after this. Um, so it used to be the editors were the the, the gatekeepers, um, and now arguably, like the people who are really pulling the strings are the people who kind of have the purse strings. Them. Oh. So I, I I guess that's made, and I think that's made editors slightly different. Um, creatures within the sort of publishing ecosystem because they're they're having to sell themselves they're almost pitching themselves as a creative partner but then they definitely need to have everyone you know um, all that all the rest of their team fully behind it and that's how they that's how they actually put together their figures for what their advance level will be nice. so so the more hard working a proposal the more likely it is you're going to get an auction and you know that that's when you can really maximize your, your position. So, And when you're talking about auction, you're talking about more than one imprint or publishing house bidding for the right to publish your work? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that is an ideal situation. How important is it that the proposal follow the template that you described, which is, you know, mm. couple chapter structures, an introduction, a very interesting about the author market, competition, like those types of things? I've made it sound really formulaic, haven't I? Um, <laughs> and there are templates on the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, there are there are different approaches. Like some sometimes you could write you can write sort of mini pricey of a whole book, and so you give because you want to give more than just what people think is the is is is, is the kind of meatiest, I guess, like aspect of it. Um, so. So there are different there are different ways of doing it. Some sometimes you can you can do something more creative. You can make a video. Um, really? Where, Have you done one of those? Um, I've done them. I, I mean, I think it's easier to do it with authors that. Um, say say have been doing quite a lot of media around a particular subject and then it, it sort of draws it sort of draws people in to take to take that approach um, and sort of it's 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 an invitation to a com to a further conversation mm. um, but for the most part I think setting something down in writing for, for some of the other reasons we described gives you more overall control uh, in the future and again this is just to clarify for nonfiction a little bit different I'm assuming for fiction yeah, for fiction, it has to be the whole novel. Wow. So it's um, so you can't just do like here's two chapters of the novel that I would like to write. Can you please pay me to write the rest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 you, you can as as an author who is already is already published has um, like twenty New York Times bestsellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her belt. We might we might do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I always sympathise with authors for that um, because. But then if you're writing, if you're writing like commercial suspense, you know, the, the ending is going to be possibly the most important part. Um, so you kind of, you need to know, you need to know that um, in order to, in order to commission it. So yeah, it's just a, a, a unfortunate kind of prerequisite. So I uh, remember very distinctly when I wrote my book proposal, I was like, I'm not going to follow the template. I'm going to do my own thing. And it was pretty much 40 pages of my Instagram posts, literally. <laughs> and I was like, here you go, Charlie. <laughs> and I remember you were so nice. You're like, oh, this is so great and so brilliant and blah, blah, blah. And then I remember I went to my friend's house and he showed me his book proposal. 
And I became very nervous. I was like, oh, you know, maybe I really should have, have done it a little bit differently. So I went back and I asked you, hey, Charlie, just tell me honestly, like, are there problems with the book proposal? Do you think it could need a little work? And you were so nice about it. And you're like, well, I, you know, I think we could tweak things here and there. And by the end of our conversation, it became very clear that I just needed to do the whole thing. <laughs> 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 You're like maybe you could cut out some of these photos. I do. I do remember the. I do remember the posts that were that were around. A little extraneous. Yeah. Um, but maybe could you describe? Because I think people would be so interested to hear. Like, what did you think when you first saw my? If you can remember, even like that first proposal, which was, I genuinely think it was like a page, and then of writing, and then like forty pages of just screenshots of my Instagram post. I didn't. I, I wasn't overly concerned because I knew that that would then develop into develop into something. And actually, at that stage, you're you're wanting to just draw out more. Um, so, you know, there's no reason not to be encouraging around that. Um, plus, I think we'd spoken quite quite a lot, and you were you were articulating what you wanted to do, and it was clear that it was clear that you were going to be able to write in a singular really intriguing voice and it was just a question of getting that down bit by bit on the page so um was it hard for you to wait for me I felt like at a certain point it was like it must be like pulling teeth with me because it took me a year to write that thing um I don't I don't remember I don't remember it taking that long actually a really long time <laughs> Especially because I had to redo it after you were like. I, I think, think once you did, I think once you did the redo, then you that kind of you got quickly. you got you. Then you were like, I, I I've got it now. <laughs> yeah. And there's always like that that moment where I was like, I, I've, I've got it, and that's 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 quite nice. And then it was like <laughs> rocket fuel. I remember one time you were trying to encourage me, and you're like, think of it as a legal brief, Joanne. <laughs> you have deadlines. You can't just like ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> just got got you on the legal uh, on the legal loophole yeah i actually yeah whenever yeah this is if ever i mention like a legal term usually usually did the trick it's a quid pro quo joanne exactly. some due diligence required here <laughs> okay so we get the proposal together then what sort of magic are you working because to me it really was like a magician i mean you said okay i'm gonna send these out to people and then i heard hear back from you a week later okay we have an yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i was like what sort of magic see you got you, you got the proposal good there you, you know go. so there, there it <laughs> that is was the magic um but i mean yeah i never really peeked behind that curtain to see what you were doing at that during those whatever eight days so then it's a mix of a you're selecting the the editors specific editors and then imprints uh, at the at the publishers that you think are best suited um so and then you know depending on the specific editor it's a mixture of you're sending a, a submission pitch by email um so that's a sort of further pitch on top of your proposal um or you know you decide that you that you really want to call someone up and you know, to say, actually, we had this conversation like six months ago and you were looking for something really different um, in a particular space. And I think I've got something incredible here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you then you then tee them up for, for the submission. So it's a it's a mix of it's a mix of both. But it's always like, you know, it's it's like pitch time. It's the fun. It's the exciting time. And suddenly you're suddenly you're there. But it's it's horrible for an author because, you know, suddenly the, the, the work has gone out. And, and sometimes it can take a week, which is great. And then sometimes it can take, it can take, it can take over a month, it can take months. Mm -hmm. And, but it's still, and, it, and you can still get a great response eventually because the moment that first indicator of interest comes back, you know, you've got something to, you know, got something to build on. Um, and so you can tell publishers and suddenly, you know, you can, you can have a number of people coming back at that stage. So, um, I think that question of faith um, is 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 hard for a for an author because they're they're the ones who've just put so much into that, and you don't you don't know it can be relatively arbitrary sometimes in terms of timing, and you can't conclude that much from it. Um, but yeah, basically, I'm sort of prodding away um, with anything that I anything that I can mm -hmm. to to get to sort of get these responses or if it's getting really exciting then you know you're already strategizing about how you're gonna kind of go Leverage, through the various yeah. processes um you know to to get the best result so 
How often do you see an auction situation for debut authors? I'd say if if something sell if something sells, then it's sort of sometimes you can cut off an auction situation by getting someone to pay. So they, they call it a preempt. Um, but you can sort of almost you can work towards a preempt if you think someone's going to be the best partner. Mm-hmm. You you're then working towards what the market value for the book is anyway, as if you had an auction. Um, so. Yeah, you, you 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 can you can do it that way. Um, usually, if there's interest, other people will declare. Like you'd be surprised if someone's not declaring some interest. Um, so that can often lead to lead to another lead, and then you set a deadline. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, and some of the time it can just be that one particular publisher has been looking looking for a book, and and they're the ones that you know they're the ones that end up commissioning it. Um, and they, they sort of take it off the table quite early. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where a publisher is interested, but in your head you're thinking, I don't think this is the right partner for my particular author? Yes, I think, I think you can have that. Um, and then I think you need, to, you need to just have a very clear line of, of communication with the author. I mean, I think you need to be able to say, look, you know, for X, Y, Z reason, this is, this is what you'd put together. This could be a likely scenario for the book. Um, and then you can, and then you can make a decision. Mm -hmm. So once you get into a situation where publishers have shown interest, uh, and you know, you're in an auction situation or you're trying to, you know, frame a negotiation that sort of nudges one particular Mm. publisher to the fore can you describe like numbers because I'm sure many many people are interested in hearing well what are the numbers like when I first for example um, was looking into signing a book deal the the proposal had already gone out you had taken it out I remember Anthony and I were like googling (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what should we expect in book advances? And I remember thinking to myself, I think it's going to be like five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did you did the right you did the right googling then yeah. to um, to like, set expectations. Like five thousand dollars, maybe at the most like fifteen thousand. <laughs> and I didn't share any of this with you because I was like, I'm just let pet Charlie do his thing. <laughs> but I was like five to fifteen thousand dollars, and obviously I was ridiculously floored when you came back with the initial offer. But, you know, without going into the specifics, because I'm not sure that we can, Mm. um, you know, like in general, um, you know, what can a first time author expect? I think it really depends what they're writing. Um, So, so there are some areas of publishing that just generally don't garner the same level of advance. But again, if you, if you have an auction situation, something which starts off very low can 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 literally go 10 20 times where it where it began um so i'm not trying to avoid answering this question <laughs> it can all. range anywhere from five thousand dollars to six figures. i think i think i think yeah i mean i think non-fiction you can um if if there are things that if the, if there are comparable examples and um you you have a sense of where the market is for that book you you can you can probably say where you're kind of aiming to get to a little bit more um uh, confidently um but i think yeah and and also commercial publishing you want to have a result where where publishers are thinking this is this is the best possible so that's that's the the job as an agent to engineer the situation so that a publisher is paying what they think the best Mm. scenario for a book is, Mm. but they really, yeah, range. It can range anywhere from the four figures to the seven (laughs) figures and, you know, um, everything in between. Have you ever recommended against taking the highest offer to an author? And the reason I ask is that for me, I, you know, again, I was extremely pleased with my advance, but I also know having spoken to a couple of my author friends that it was by no means the highest offer Mm -hmm. um, that would have been available for a first time cookbook author. Right. But I was actually kind of glad I, I, when you, Mm. you know, and just to be very frank with everyone, you know, Charlie came back with multiple different numbers that kept getting higher and I started to get a little stressed out. It's like, I don't want them to be too I remember, high. I remember, I remember you saying that. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I was like, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Charlie, because I know you get a cut of it. <laughs> I don't want it to be too high because I, you know, at a certain point, then there's an expectation tied to that, you yes. know, and as a first time author, I was so nervous. I was already, you know, saddled with crazy amounts of imposter syndrome. I was like, I think I deserve $5,000. <laughs> I'll take five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was worried that, well, like how many books am I going to need to sell? <laughs> like to, to, no, definitely. Know. That's, and that's a very, that's a very real thing. And when it, that, that can turn out really badly for authors, um, yeah. you know, because the, the level of hype and expectation around the book then becomes, it, it becomes an albatross and, yeah you know, actually it affects where you go, where you go next. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's not something not to think about. Um, but on the flip side, a publisher's then, you know, committed in every way to a project. But I think the original question was, That's have right. I, have I, have I advised um, someone to go with a lower offer? And I have. Um, often, often that will be as a result of that person having met it will be that there are there are close offers, and you know you've got your best offers, um, and you know you've, you've structured it in a way where you're, you have you said I'm not taking I'm not necessarily taking the highest offer. It was down to the author's discretion, um, and there have been a few instances where the, the meetings have been so much better with one mm. publisher that um, you know they're at similar levels, and 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 that's what that's what the author decides. Um, so I would imagine one of the things that can be leveraged for a higher offer is a person's social media following. If they have, you know, mm -hmm. 10 million TikTok followers or YouTube subscribers, that's certainly something I'm assuming is you know, part of these negotiations. But, yeah. you know, one of the things that I always go out of my way to say is, you know, I had less than 40,000 Instagram followers when I signed my book deal. So... It didn't seem, at least at that time, you know, that was a few years ago, that, you know, 100,000 followers yes. was necessary. Yeah. Do you think that's changed? I don't. I, I think it's become slightly more um, of, a, of a sort of consistent theme that, that in order to get a get a kind of get the kind of deal that's really going to going to help you launch your career, you might want to wait longer just to just to get up. But it can be that like. You have such a singular approach, which you did, and you also had a very, very strong aesthetic and beautiful storytelling, and people were people were enraptured by that. That was a, that was a separate thing to the following. Thirty-seven thousand people were enraptured by it. Yeah, but but also <laughs> you you then had a you you then had a concept which was then different to anything that was out there um, currently. Um, so. I think that was another thing that publishing was probably doing a little bit more was saying, what haven't we, where, where have we overpublished and where, where are we underrepresented? Mm -hmm. um, and that comes into, that comes into their decision-making. And I think that's still, that's still the case. I mean, there are some cuisines that are probably overpublished still. Um, almost to the point now where people are deliberately looking for things that could, could gather like, extra momentum because mm, they just mm -hmm. literally haven't been represented represented before um so i do think it's a sort of interesting space but yeah i i think given the number of authors that are coming through from social media um you're looking at you're looking at trying to find a point of difference within the proposal um that that's really going to do the do the thing that's partly the traditional market and partly the, the partly leaning into the audience that's already there um, and that, that's a sort of, that's quite an interesting middle ground that I don't think has completely settled itself yet. How much intention do you put into lining up a roster where you can look at that and say, you know what, I have a pretty diverse group of clients, mm. you know, whether it's in point of view, uh, subject matter, um, certainly experience, um, you know, cultural backgrounds. I mean, mm. you just mentioned, hey, Korean food wasn't as represented at the time. I can certainly attest to that because I looked for it yeah. um, you yeah. know, at the time. Certainly Korean vegan food was just a, a non-existent at that time, at least in the, the book space here in, in the English language, as far as I could tell. Is that something that's important to you when you're considering, again, that talent pool? Definitely. I mean, I think it's also a huge privilege to have um, the, the idea that you're 
I mean, I, I, I've, I've always thought of literary agent is sort of like, it's like a magpie education. You're kind of, you're sort of a sponge for people who've got something different and interesting to say. Um, like Tinjung. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie is really good at making Tinjung to get everyone <laughs> because of me. <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I totally broke your train of thought. <laughs> um, no, I'm just uh, still embarrassed. Um, I, th- I, I think being able to be able to work with people that sort of educate you. I mean, it's sort of it's this sort of learning experience that comes through. So it's it just becomes a way of living life in a way. Um, and so the, the more diverse the voices, the more you're learning how to navigate your own, your own life and various issues around that. So you become, you become more expert. Oh, no, you become better read in areas that you might not have, um, might not have discovered. Mm, that uh, sounds so much like being a trial lawyer, a litigator. Right, yeah. You learn about so many random things like, how to maximize the use of a washing machine, <laughs> how not to build a staircase, <laughs> um, what kind of paper to use. Um, I just like random bits of knowledge because like you said, I'm a magpie of all of these different pools of education mm. by virtue of the clients that I you know, have had the honor of working with. So moving forward, you secure the deal, one year later, you sign the contract because that, is, as I learned, is Does the take a while. average time to go from so-called hitting, you know, making a deal and actually signing the deal. So let's, you know, you've moved on from there. Let's talk about actually working with your authors to write the book. Mm. What do you find to be the most challenging part about that process? Yeah, I mean, it's, sometimes it can be that you're sudden, you're suddenly then into the, that next phase, um, and so you've you've had a proposal, you've you've had, some, but then you know you've got a different relationship with your publishing editor, um, and you've still got another yet another kind of creative leap to make, and um, it can either be that you're making quite minor edits. Mm. Um, so with, with with fiction, you know, publishers sort of commissioned commission the novel as is um but there'll still be rounds of edits um but it's sort of it's slightly more contained often um but with with non-fiction suddenly you're writing you're writing the book and that can take on a really different shape from the indicator that you've given um so i think sometimes it's good to sort of send early material to your agent um, you can sort of go back and forth on it potentially. Sometimes you've got that really good rapport with an editor where you just send it to the editor and the agent at the same time. Um, and it's, you know, here's, here's some opening, here's some opening sample material. What do you, you know, what do you think? And that way you, you're not sort of sending yourself away for that deadline date that's sort of in 18 months time and then potentially coming up with something which isn't going to, isn't going to necessarily work. Um, so I think it depending, it just depends on the, some authors prefer to work that way and just produce, you know, the finished text. Do you ever wish that they hadn't? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think whether that's worked out really. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think sometimes, I think sometimes authors are surprised by the amount of feedback that then comes back. Mm-hmm. It's like, and, and in the language of delivering a manuscript, a, you know, it's a certain level of words that doesn't necessarily mean it's 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 near its finished form. Yeah. Um, and it's quite difficult to give a precursor to that. You don't want to say, oh, you know, you, you might have to have several versions of, of, of this, but that can just be part of the part of the learning curve um, to get onto that second version where actually you kind of iron out quite a lot of what isn't quite right. I remember when I received my first round of feedback from Lucia, I uh, went home and I cried. (laughs) Yeah. And I remember, like, I don't know if I said anything to Anthony, but I remember telling myself I was such a fool. I thought that I could quit my lawyer job and just write full time. Well, I've now just received confirmation that that was a pipe dream. I can never be a full-time author. I'm a terrible writer. 
this is never going anywhere. I, I was certain when, you know, but that's partly my personality. I'm, I'm like always doomsdaying everything and, you know, slight criticism turns into like, oh, you suck <laughs> immediately. You're your own harshest critic. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 we'll turn that around. How, how, how do you feel about that now? I mean, I think that, number one, I think, you know, Lucia's suggestion that we include, you know, 25 more recipes was a good one because I think it would have been too light if mm-hmm. we had gone with just the original, which I think was like 50 uh, so, I mean, 50 recipes in a cookbook is just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So in that respect, it was right. But, you know, her recommendation at the time was to cut out most of the writing. And I took that as an indication that my writing sucked. Mm. I think that's pretty un- understandable, especially since I was a first-time author and I wasn't a creative writer. I was a legal writer. <laughs> um, but, you know, ultimately, I was happy to receive like working feedback as in let's take this writing and let's make it better. But when she said, let's just cut it all out. Of course, that was a very different kind of feedback. Ultimately, we ended up putting most of it back in, Yeah, you know, and I, you know, working with her to put it back in was at once agonizing, Mm -hmm. um, but also incredibly um, fulfilling. Like I learned so much through that process. But I guess, you know, the question that I had kind of related to that, not really, because I think that I had about the best a relationship with an editor and a publisher that an author could dream of having. So I, I, I don't ever feel like I needed you as a shield from them ever. Mm. Um, perhaps you did, and I just don't know about it because <laughs> I don't <laughs> want to know about it. Um, but have you ever felt that that was your job, was to protect your author from perhaps excessive aggression from a publisher or you know, a publisher that was maybe taking too many liberties with your author? Yeah, no, I mean, and that can happen. That can happen all the time. Um, sometimes someone's editorial style really doesn't chime with, with an author. Um, and then you have, to, you have to work that out. Uh, because, because that could be the, the, the way the feedback is given will be someone might, might rewrite particular sentences in a way that that author could never write. Um, as opposed to giving sort of top line, broad brushstroke, like, we can't do this at the moment, um, but we might we might be able to bring it back in. But this is this is what we need for the overall structure of the book. Some of it can be more voice led, and that can be really problematic. And if that is an issue, then you have to curb that excess. Um, so that can be and that can be difficult yeah. um, for the author and for you, yeah. and and for the publisher, um, because you know you're you're basically saying we're going to you can have to sort of climb down um sometimes people can disagree on a you know they can disagree with the argument that uh, an author is making and an author can completely disagree with the kind of editorial that's being given um and you know that that obviously creates a difficulty um and that's just part of things that can that can happen um i'd say that's more likely to happen with something that's sort of issue based, um, but you know, um, you're then you're then there to try and find a trying to find a way through, um, and often that means getting in the corner of your author as you as you should be. Mm-hmm. What does that look like, though? I mean, does that mean like literally? It's not a physical fight. Don't <laughs> Like, do you like... I train all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen you. The, I mean, the idea of, yeah, the idea of... Um, I, the tiger. Pu- pu- publish- publishers. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think many people are particularly intimidating. In the, uh, may, may stand corrected, but no, it doesn't come to... Um, to blows. It doesn't come to blows. No. Mm-hmm. Well, let's hope not. Uh, at least not for Charlie Brothers. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. So we've gotten through the writing phase. It's, it's now publication is coming. And I wanted to touch upon what you mentioned earlier, which is there are some authors who are sort of, you know, very, very defiant in mm. their stance about marketing and promoting their book. Not my job. My job was to write the book. It's now yeah. the job of XYZ to sell the book. I literally saw a tweet on this issue probably six months ago where an author was like, hey, I wrote the book, not my job to sell it, not my job to promote it, not my job to market it. And, you know, she was tweeting this as a lesson, a PSA, if you will, to other authors saying, and if anyone tells you otherwise, they're wrong. Right. <laughs> is it, but is it right? 
I mean, it, it probably wouldn't be now, now the way that publicity works. It probably wouldn't be in the author's best interest. So whether it's whether it's worth like disseminating that as like this should be how you approach it, I'm not. I'm not completely sure. Um, I think I think an author knows their book the best. So if you know, o often it is a collaboration. It's like, what are the best angles here? What should we be offering to X? And someone could say, well, that that is your job. But they could also say that is your job and I can do it really well with you or I can make you even better at doing it because I'm going to be able to help feed you the lines that are going to mean that the op-ed editor at the Atlantic is going to be more likely to, to, to take it on. Um, so the sort of value that you have uh, in, in actually kind of bettering your chances in author career um, mean that working closely um, and helping to promote is probably in your best interest. Anyway. But, mm -hmm. but you know, and then uh, you, I, I can totally see why someone would feel, well, I've, I've produced what I was asked to see, do. I can't see that. Because of exactly what you just described. Why wouldn't you help? Like you said, you know, as the author, I know the book better than anyone else. Mm. And I want it to sell. Yeah. I mean, there's no, I mean, unless you just don't care if the book sells, I suppose, then why, why did you even write it at that point? You could have written it and kept it in your room, you yeah. know? So like, yeah. if you want people to read your book, then why wouldn't you feel like, yeah, I want to participate in this. I had a lot of trouble understanding that tweet. Now you talked about like back maybe in the 1930s, you know, when George Orwell was writing his mm. book, maybe he had that mindset. Yeah, I, I've written the book. It's it's not my not my job. I mean, where does that even come from? I, I mean, I th I think it uh, often it comes with. I I can understand a, a little bit why someone would do that because their th their whole energy has been built in the stylistic production of you know this this thing that people are you know they're the receiver, the reader is supposed to understand what the intention was and to, and to then try and sell it in a way which seems slightly reductive to mm. that mystery. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I could, I could probably see that. But the reality is now that people, you know, authors are, pub, you know, the, the more of a public figure you are, the, the, the more you're likely to appeal to a wider audience. Um, so it has become kind of more part and parcel. Um, so to not do it would be more of an act of self-sabotage than it would have been uh, in an earlier era where people just start, you know, they would just talk about a book and that's how the word of mouth word would, of mouth, would yeah. spread. Do you think word of mouth still plays a large role Definitely. in marketing? Yeah. 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 How does that even start, though? I mean, where does that start? Because I think to people like me who've grown up with social media and buy half the things that they buy through Instagram, mm. I mean, it's sort of a mystery. Word of mouth is one one part of the the various things that have to happen in order for a book to just get more and more visibility. They say that if people see it in three different contexts or hear about something in three different contexts, they then are more likely to buy the book. Oh, I love that. They might see one review. Um, someone might have spoken to them about it personally, um, and 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 then they're sort of they see it in a bookshop, um, and those those golden three then produce the produce the, the buy version. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I remember, and, and we were talking about this kind of offline, you know, I do remember at a certain point, I think probably a few months um, after I'd handed in my manuscript and, you know, the changes had been made and you said to me, what's your social media plan? And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, Charlie, I've already grown my Instagram account to like 60,000 followers. Like, what more do you want from me? I, mm. I remember having that thought but then you know I'm always the people pleaser and I'm like well if Charlie needs me to grow my social media <laughs> following then I guess I need to do something what a monster <laughs> <laughs> so I remember um you know around that time is when people were talking a lot about TikTok and you know I've talked about why I started a TikTok account many times I did it as a consumer but at a certain point I decided to start sharing food content and I remember that was directly correlated to the fact that my literary agent had questioned me about my social media strategy for when the book came out. And obviously, the rest is history. My whole life changed as a result of starting my TikTok account. Thank you, Charlie, for changing my life in so many different ways. <laughs> but I guess my question is, what role does social media play? Is it a large one? 
Does it have to be a large one in an author's marketing and promotion strategy? I think it does depend what you're what you're writing, um, and also how. I mean, I think. I think the brilliant thing that your social media has shown is that you have an embarrassment of riches. Like you can you can speak on any number of different subjects, um, and I think it it meant that people came to you from completely different backgrounds. Um, you created. Um, a, a momentum that was sort of irresistible um, and that's unusual and then you know to have that breadth is a is a publicist dream so you know you're, you're able to you're able to appear on x show at the same time as writing an op-ed in the atlantic i mean that was that was a rare that was a rare talent um how how important is is someone's social media to their ability to promote a book um I think, I think some people, it's a natural extension of how, of their personality on their social media and that's how it can, that's how it can work really well. Um, they have to be excited about the book in order to, in order to do that. Um, so it sort of stems back in, in, into sort of first principles, like, are you behind the concept of the book? How, if you're looking at it purely as just like something, you, you know, you, it made sense to do, you know, at what point is that going to mean that you're slightly limited in the way that you're helping to helping to pitch and promote it. So I could sit here for four more hours asking you way more questions, but A, we need to go eat some vegan sushi and B, I don't think my battery is going to last very much longer, <laughs> but I do have like some serious like questions that I, I definitely need to get through, even if we can't have video of it, because <laughs> I want the audio version to, to answer some of these questions. One of the things that I'm picking up from you is you know, writing a book for a lot of people, especially if it's their first one, it is a taxing, demanding, and incredibly emotional process. I don't care if you're writing a book about wrenches. <laughs> like it, it's, it's you're putting yourself mm. on paper for potentially thousands of strangers to read and judge you on. And so most people are very keen on putting their best foot forward and they're looking to their agent to help them realize on that vision, an incredibly personal one. It sounds to me that one of the most important aspects of, of writing a book when you are represented by an agent is building not just rapport, but sort of like legendary levels of trust. Mm. How do you go about doing that with your authors? Yeah, and I th it, it becomes absolutely crucial to your relationship. And I, and I, think, I think it happens incrementally. You know, you, 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 start, you start going back and forth. You start, you know, there is that element of, of, of trying to avoid a situation where you could, you could have your confidence knocked and just trying to build up to what you know the, the author is capable of. Um, and, you know, that, that, that just, that takes time. It takes conversations that... Um, that can lead to even just putting that first pen to paper. Um, but I think it, it is the basis of your, it's the basis of your relationship going, going forward. Have you ever had like extremely unexpectedly emotional moments with your authors? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, a, a lot. I mean, I think that, that everything's, everything's heightened, um, you know, and that, that, that can mean, you know, extreme happiness, and and often you know the opposite um and you you sort of go through that together because you've you've, you've you're you working together i mean is it really that jerry Maguire type of situation <laughs> where he's like you're my agent <laughs> like yeah. i mean because honestly i mean i will say personally like that is definitely the truth for me but sometimes i wonder are all literally literary agents like that do they view themselves in that capacity where they're a steward a friend a mentor a peer all of these things sort of a therapist mm. you know kind of like wrapped into this one person there is this really special relationship that i think can blossom but i don't know if that's really typical anymore maybe when you know your great mentor ed mm. was in his heyday and doing that that was the quintessential relationship i just wonder if that remains true 
I think I think as you're shepherding someone through a, a publishing process, um, they can be surprised at various different points, and things can things can sort of almost surprise they surprise the agent sort of in in terms of what people's reaction to you know say if it's editorial feedback um so i i think inevitably if you have it if you have a sense of wanting to 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 sort of explain um and reassure um i don't know to what extent that's a personality type what I do think happens within a publication process is that you're going to have touch points throughout it and vulnerability yeah. and there's going to be, yeah, exactly. There's going to, there's going to be consequently, there's going to be some vulnerability and, um, and you just need to be able to work, work through those. That can be very difficult. I mean, I, I think that, that not all people are equipped to receive that vulnerability and create mm. a safe space for that. Mm. Um, and that's, a unique talent that an agent has to have, like Jerry Maguire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, every year I watch Jerry Maguire. <laughs> I learn from the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think that that's something that, again, I wonder, that I hope that all authors can have with their agents. I mean, one of the things that I thought was so lovely was that you took an interest in not just my writing. Like, you... you had an interest in ensuring that all aspects of my career were sort of working together. Mm. Um, and to the extent that you could facilitate you know, realizing a much larger vision than just for the book, you were right there to do that. And, you know, obviously I, I feel extremely lucky um, that I was partnered with somebody who had the ability to do that. I, I mean, is that the role that literary agents play? I mean, do they help them beyond books? I think, I think it again. It depends on. As I said before, you, you you do have a kind of embarrassment of of riches. Like you you are able to do a number of different things, and just being able to honestly, the the, the, the pleasure of being a literary agent is that vicarious enjoyment of seeing someone's uh, career blossom, and seeing that well, actually, there's no reason to look at this. Um, in, in a sort of atomized way, this is part, this is part of a bigger, this is part of a bigger picture. Um, and, and you grew, you know, you grew into that role and it was, it was, it was extraordinary, um, but it was all there, you know? Um, and, and so I guess being, being involved in different parts is just, it's just extra satisfaction. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a lucky, lucky position to sometimes be in. One of uh, my favorite sayings, and, and this is for Barbara because she's the one who shared this with me. So thanks, Barbara. I'm going to use it again. One of my favorite sayings is I've had some, she always told me, I've had some of the best success in my life when someone close to me believed in me just a little bit more than I believed in mm. myself. How often do you find yourself playing that role, being the one who believes in your author a little bit more than they believe in themselves? I think that can happen. That can happen quite regularly, um, and and then seeing it, seeing that develop, it, it, and also you can you can then get on different you can get on different paths with that, um, and it's sort of it, it it's 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 a really interesting one. I think your challenge is to try and find find that one bit of impetus that then that then gives that you know, it, 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 it provides that breakthrough moment um, where where you realize that you're, you're able to help someone realize that talent. Mm. A couple of controversial questions. Oh, <laughs> I, knew they were, I knew they were coming. <laughs> we wax poetic on the importance and value of having a literary agent. What about people who say, I don't need an agent. I can do this on my own. I think that's. I mean, I think that's valid. Um, it 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 depends on what approach you're taking to to, to publishing overall. Um, you know, and I'd say for for people that are writing within particular genres, they that they can definitely make that work, and they can point to some examples um, where it can happen. I it's more difficult because you don't have you don't have that person that's between you, often and a and a and a publisher. Mm -hmm. um, so. And, and that that can that can manifest itself in so many different ways. Um, also, 
you, you then if you're, you're if you're in a contractual situation, yeah, how are you going to navigate that particular area and know what is is normal in terms of what kind of rights you're giving away? Um, another question that's a little bit controversial, but prescient. A lot of writers right now are finding themselves out of a job or are taking on the onus of creating laws, regulation, or protocols for dealing with AI and, mm -hmm. and the scepter of AI and, and its impact on writers and other artists. What are your thoughts on you know, where we are creatively and you know, from a literary perspective, given what we're now seeing with AI and its capacity? Yeah, I mean, I think that no doubt we're at a sort of crossroads. It's something which has kind of crept up from, I, I mean, really with um, chat GPT, that just, it, it, it broke it out into, into the mainstream. And ever since then, we've been trying to grapple with it. Um, I, think, I think what we need is people who have strong voices and strong takes on, on these things. Um, I think we're, we're kind of, we're trying to learn as an industry anyway, like how to how to navigate it and realize that that is a massive work in progress. Um, but it's also too early to say where creativity is going, um, you know, and, and, and in terms of publishing itself, it's it's always been an industry that's had these like moments where supposedly it, it, its role becomes more redundant and it and it, and it has you know, managed to persevere. Like um, e-books. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. Like mm -hmm. e-books or, yeah, um, the Google library. They've, they're going to scan all, scan all the books and, you know, make them make them available. Um, and they have been resilient as um, physical products. But obviously, it, you know, that's just, as you've experienced, um, you know, in a visceral way, the, the way in which this is happening is far more insidious and wide. And also we've, we've, we've gone through a period of, basically giving technology um, a kind of free hand. Exactly. And now it's coming back. I mean, I, um, I work with an author who's a human rights barrister. She wrote a book called The Freedom to Think. Um, sorry, it was Freedom to Think in the end. Um, and it was about the fundamental human right of uh, the freedom of thought, which actually is in the U uh, Geneva Convention um, and how we are in a, in a sort of real life dystopia, giving that away all the time. And, and maybe the, the excesses of AI are that first sort of kickback on that. Um, so she's writing a new book called Human Rights and Robot Wrongs. Okay, everyone, let's <laughs> look for that. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, where can people send you their cover letters, Charlie? Oh, yeah, of course. I'm available at all times. <laughs> So you, they can find you on the internet, right? Just at uh, BCM? Yes, exactly. Yeah. BCM.com, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Great. That's the one. Well, I hope you enjoyed that chat with my representative of Quan, the Brit who changed my life and made all my dreams come true. I've often said that sometimes you will experience the biggest and most success in your life when you surround yourselves with people who believe in you just a little bit more than you believe in yourself. And I truly believe that Charlie has been that person for me. Anyway, everyone, thanks so much for joining me for another episode of Are You Ready with Joanne Molinaro. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, leave a comment and a rating below. Let me know who you want to hear from next. Otherwise, in the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful and lovely day.